Um, thank you very much, Hoda, for the introduction and for inviting me to be here um, to moderate and introduce the speakers for the fifth and final panel session that we'll have, continuing the theme of structural inequalities. Um, so I appreciate all of you being here, um, here sort of at the 11th hour of the conference um, here as um, the sun starts to go down a little bit um, on this beautiful day. So um, very pleased to um, announce we have three very excellent speakers um, covering different aspects of this topic. They're each gonna speak as has been the case before for about 20 minutes and then we will take some questions from the audience um, about the different, the different um, papers and topics that are um, covered. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Simon Dalby. Um, Dr. Dalby is Professor of Geography and Environmental Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. There he teaches in the Balsillie School of International Affairs, and he's also a senior fellow at CIGI, which is the Center for International Governance Innovation. He's the co-editor of several um, edited um, book volumes on geopolitics and climate change, um, all published by Routledge. He also is the sole author of three books, um, the first of which is Creating the Second Cold War, which is published in 1990, um, and I think had a reprint recently, so that's always good. Um, the second of which is Environmental Security, published by University of Minnesota in 2002, and more recently, Security and Environmental Change um, by Polity in 2009. His current research is focusing on the issue of climate discourse in our contemporary political debate, looking at how climate on the issue of climate and climate change is presented, um, and also the strategies that groups use in the media. So today he's gonna to speak to us about peace, violence, and inequality in a climate disputed world. Dr. Dalby. Well, the technical help is getting my uh uh, slideshow ready. Um, I would like to thank Hoda and Kate and Ernesto and all the rest of the gang here for um, this, uh, putting this event on and for the invitation. I appreciate it. Um, the last two days have been thoroughly stimulating um, and exactly what I needed um, to, uh, to get my thought processes moving ahead because technically I'm on sabbatical at the moment. Um, so um, a bit of stimulation is what I needed. Peace, Violence, and Inequality in a Climate Disrupted World um, is the, uh, the, the title I gave myself. Um, I want to emphasize the last three words in that title because climate disrupted world um, is the context in which we need to think particularly about structural inequality, which is the topic of our panel. And if what I'm going to say in the next few minutes appears to be very far from the category that I was assigned, i.e. structural inequality, um, uh, it is actually at the heart of much of the discussion about climate change, who needs to act to deal with it, um, because the people that have actually caused most of the climate change um, in the last while um, are the ones that are, with some very notable exceptions, um, uh, not um, the primary victims of the consequences of climate change. And hence, climate change in many ways is a structural in, um, inequality issue right um, uh, through. Um, well, I've been puzzling about how to address these things for a long time, uh, and clearly the uh, headlines in the last few weeks have juxtaposed both extraordinary fires. This one, I think, is California. Um, I spent the summer in British Columbia um, looking at very hazy skies, staying indoors on a few occasions precisely because of the, the smoke from the forest fires. Um, it does get your attention uh, very dramatically because, of course, fire is a crucial part of um, one of the, think, the problems of climate change. Um, and one of the things that uh, we are having to deal with is increasing wildfires, um, increasingly severe wildfires, not just in the western part of this continent. Um, think Portugal, um, think Greece. Um, uh, think Russia, think various other places over the last couple of years as um, clearly climate change is causing um, uh, difficulties relating to fire. Um, it's also, of course, about floods, it's about hurricanes and various other things, but don't forget fire, please, in all of this, because at least part of my analysis suggests that um, fire is coming back um, to haunt us, because, of course, it is precisely the human use of fire um, that is causing climate change in the first place. Uh, 
Google Stephen Pine's um, Fire Age article. It's in Aeon magazine about three years ago. He makes a very simple argument that forget all this discussion about language and technology and all the rest of it and culture as making us humans. What makes us human is our control of fire because we're the only species that does it. And controlling fire has made modern humans um, and has also changed the landscape quite fundamentally um, in this process. Whales do complex languages and, 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 and songs. Beavers are great dam builders. Ants do all sorts of complex um, uh, structures. Um, but what makes us human is fire. Our domestication of fire, um, us becoming the fire species. And of course, it's precisely that that is the crucial geophysical process which is causing climate change um, to accelerate uh, because of the combustion products, because of our increasing control of fire. At the heart of this um, is this issue, which is why I start with a slide that juxtaposes um, firefighters' fire and the dangers to obvious human structures as the context in which we need to think. Climate science is becoming politicized, and of course, um, you know, you can see presumably from the back row that this um, uh, placard um, has footnotes. Uh, yeah, I like this idea of politicized science, the science paper, um, the protest has to have the footnotes. I think that one of the problems is that the conclusion to this paper is slightly inaccurate. Um, we can do a lot about climate change, but we need to understand climate change as part of the context within which we live. It is no longer a problem that can be solved in the standard technological intervention modes that we were criticizing in a previous um, panel. Um, we are going to have to live with a certain amount of it. The question is how much um, and how are we going to live with uh, it because approximately one degree um, of climate change uh, in terms of the overall average increase in um, the planetary temperature is already in the system. Um, the question, as this diagram so nicely points at the bottom, uh, is which path are we going to take? If we don't get serious about reducing consumption quickly, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says we will be continuing down the current path, which can only be disastrous in terms of rapid, um, accelerated disruptions of the climate system. If you look up to the middle of that diagram, the so-called Little Ice Age, um, note please that the average global temperature shown by the dotted line there is just a little under what we take to be the current um, uh, take to be the current average temperature. Um, and the Little Ice Age was, of course, um, the period that environmental historians have made very clear um, caused very considerable human disruptions. The really interesting question, and connecting back with Cheryl's presentation a few minutes ago, of course, is as to whether, in fact, the Little Ice Age was an unintended artifact of the European colonization of the Americas. Because environmental history is starting to pose the question of when it was that humans actually started to alter the climate in noticeable ways. If the so-called Orbis hypothesis is correct, what happened when diseases ravaged the native populations of the Americas uh, back in the immediate aftermath of Columbus and some of the earlier, um, uh, some of the er other early European um, uh, uh, explorers, conquerors, use whichever term you wish, is in fact, of course, a massive die-off of the native population, a massive reforestation of the Americas as a consequence. And of course, when you get massive reforestation on that scale, it sucks quite a bit of carbon dioxide out of the global atmosphere. Was that, the huge question is, enough to actually trigger the climate change that became the period of the Little Ice Age and all the dramatic um, starvation problems in China and Japan, as well as across Europe, all the political ramifications which may in fact have given birth in Europe um, to the Westphalian state system. So with the context we are living in, it is a world in which humanity has changed things quite dramatically. And now in the 21st century, is changing things much, much quicker on a much, much bigger scale. But a climate disrupted world is the context within which we now need to think about what kind of social institutions are necessary for a peaceful future. We need to think about this because the world in which we live is an increasingly artificial world. It is one in which people in many places are extremely vulnerable 
precisely because of the artificiality of their existence. And this, of course, is before and after um, last year's hurricane in Puerto Rico. And you can see here um, before and after. And of course, what got trashed was the electrical grid, um, leaving all sorts of people, the phrasing is extraordinary, without power. Stop and think about that. Um, we are a society that increasingly operates with electricity and without power means without electricity to run all the gizmos and gadgets that actually make um, our life uh, as we currently live it possible. It is generating, of course, all sorts of concerns about inequalities, the colonial history of Puerto Rico, the vulnerability of peoples that have been conquered um, uh, in, in numerous different ways is part of the climate um, discussion. It is also clear that if we got any chance of maintaining the climate in something approximating what humanity has known through history, we have to stop burning um, fossil fuels and we have to find ways to convince the political elites that we need a different energy system, one that can supply the electricity which is essential for large urban systems, but do so quite literally without burning stuff. Um, and of course this leads us um, into other histories of structural um, inequalities um, and the protests uh, that, thank you Cheryl, Standing Rock um, uh, makes very, very clear. What is really interesting about Standing Rock um, is that it, is, it reflects the history of colonization, but it now reflects it with a different twist because of course this argument uh, was about pipelines and access to water and related issues. It was also about the traditional um, uh, rights of indigenous peoples that are being, if not trampled over, well run through or dug under um, by pipeline construction. Um, what fascinated me, in addition to these, because I've been tracking some of these, these controversies, obviously, um, is that some of the other people that showed up at the protest camps were American veterans of the wars in the Middle East, come to offer some of their skills and advice on how to run camps, how to operate um, uh, effectively in the face of great danger, how to deal with the militarized um, assault on the camps that the state was actually um, instigating. Uh, and they were there because they had understood from their experience um, in the Middle East that the current mode of economy and violence is simply unsustainable. Um, our old framework, and I cannot resist the visual pun, um, uh, is going to lead us to a roller coaster ride um, in the future. And this is, of course, the New Jersey uh, roller coaster that was inundated by Sandy a few years ago. Um, uh, rising sea levels means that it is undercutting our roller coaster framework. Um, and we do need to think seriously, as some of the G7 projects are beginning to, about what a new climate for peace might actually look like. Because in terms of traditional notions of security, um, what has been secured is the order of modernity, that fossil fuel consuming consumer society, um, and the uh, order of international relations that we have been talking about for the last two days. And of course, it's precisely that fossil fuel based um, power system that is causing climate change. And if we are serious about security, um, uh, then our own actions um, are undercutting the future biological um, uh, security for many peoples and for agriculture that feeds now the eight billion, nearly eight billion of us that are currently alive, never mind future generations. What is clear in all of these documents um, is that we have got to address um, how to bend the curve, literally um, turn the, um, the graph downwards rapidly. Um, the IPCC report earlier this month says we've got to cut carbon rapidly. We've got to get to basically zero carbon, um, net carbon usage by the middle of the century if we've got to stand a chance of maintaining the climate in something approximating stability and approximating the conditions in which um, humanity um, has known how to live in complex civilizations um, for the last couple of thousand years. Um, clearly, um, we need to think about security in ways that are very different um, from uh, the kind of um, fence building assumptions, the invocation of sovereignty, the invocation of exclusive territorial controls as a mode of, um, of, of, of security.
Um, I don't think anybody told a certain president that there actually was a wall on a frontier um, south of here. Um, this is it, or at least part of it. Um, the crucial point about um, this, of course, is that this was a wall built some years ago. A very strange design, which is hugely ironic and immensely symbolic of the failures to think through what kind of governance mechanisms are necessary in a climate disrupted world. Because, of course, this is the fence on the, uh, on, on the south end of, 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 I can never remember, it's either Arizona or New Mexico, um, somewhere down there. Um, the point being that the engineers have designed this, hence the strange sloping structures on the side, so that it will ride up and down as the sand dunes move. But creatures of two-legged or four-legged variety can't cross it. Birds are okay, burrowing creatures are okay, um, but two-legged creatures and four-legged creatures um, can't um, cross it. But the landscape can move the most basic climate adaptation adjustment for any species is to move. And that is precisely what sovereign government um, regulations that fear climate migrants are trying to prevent. And so we face this fundamental problem, a rapidly shifting world with a series of governance mechanisms that are trying to fence off change precisely when change is the most basic human adaptation and other species adaptation to change. So therein lies the crux of the dilemma in terms of how we fail to respond adequately to a much, much more um, interconnected world um, than we have usually understood in terms of governance mechanisms premised on state sovereignty and exclusive jurisdiction over precisely demarcated chunks of the Earth's surface. Uh, the inequalities that this, of course, um, emphasizes are precisely that rich elites can move um, poor people usually can't. Indigenous peoples frequently are denied access to land and indeed frequently um, by ironically climate adjustment, climate adaptation measures are excluded from land um, precisely by the increasing um, expansion of corporate agriculture. Um, and I knew that we were in trouble about a decade ago when I read a newspaper article um, about uh, a series of corporations um, uh, in India um, buying up land in Ethiopia and dispossessing Ethiopian indigenous peoples from land that they didn't know they didn't own because they'd been there for generations. Uh, but they didn't have formal legal title to the land and hence were disposed of, displaced, told to go find someplace else to live, no doubt ending up um, in those rapidly um, growing informal settlements, slums, favelas, whatever you want to call them, peri-urban areas um, around Addis. The point there, and this is my final point, of course, is that this global economy is linking together people in all sorts of complicated ways, but it is also an urban economy. The nodes in this are cities and towns. We have become an urban species. Depending on which set of stats you look at, it was somewhere in the last decade, half of the human population lives in what are formally designated as urban settlements. And in the process, we are rewiring, replumbing the planet um, to support those populations with all sorts of consequences um, uh, for uh, indigenous peoples. But also, crucially, when, as that slide I showed you a few minutes ago of Puerto Rico, and think Florida and Georgia in the last couple of weeks, or bits of Portugal, perhaps, um, when the power gets switched off by increasingly severe storms, increasingly frequent storms, fires, and related hazards, which inevitably will increase as climate change kicks in, um, who can switch back on, who can move and live in another city easily, um, and who can't, emphasizes the structural inequalities um, in the global economy, because of course poverty um, is really about frequently lack of options, whereas affluence allows you to get up and move, the elites don't worry about storms. Um, they simply get in their private airplanes and fly to another one of their condos in some other part of the world. Um, the local residents who are entirely dependent on having their air conditioners work and their fridges work, and it is important to consider 
those who have access to air conditioners are far less vulnerable to heat waves than those who don't, another crucial geophysical um, dimension to um, structural inequality. Uh, we are in increasingly an artificial set of circumstances generated by this global economy which interconnects us in all sorts of complicated ways, um, leaving people, because of this rapidly expanding technosphere, um, vulnerable in new ways, but also accentuating some of the old structural inequalities, not least the fate of indigenous peoples um, caught um, in the uh, expansion of modernity. I'm going to stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Dalby. Um, our next um, speaker will be Dr. Michael Allen. Dr. Allen holds the Harvey Wexler Chair in Political Science at Bryn Mawr, where he has been throughout most of his career, other than a few um, stints with prestigious fellowships in government service. Um, Dr. Allen has also held administrative posts in the Department of Political Science and the Program for International Studies. Um, his research focuses at the intersection of international political economy and international law, typically with a focus on Africa or the Caribbean. He is the author of two books that look at various issues related to political development and economic development in South Africa. The first is Globalization, Negotiation, and the Failure of Transformation in South Africa, published by Paul Grave in 2006. And most recently, very recently, um, he's the author of Democracy and Modernity in, in Southern Africa, Development or Deformity, which was published by Cornell University last year. So um, without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Allen, who's going to speak to us on Peace in Pieces, Limits to Progress in Economy, Ethics, and World Order. Thank you for your introduction, and thanks to Dr. Hoda and Drs. Hoda and Kate and, and Ernesto for, F, for the wonderful conference you've put together. We've been very comfortable. We feel like family already, including the regular visitors who come and ask questions. Thank you very much for your contributions. Um, let me go straight into mine, because before you know it, I'll get a two-minute sign. And um, what I have is densely condensed. Uh, it will ex be expanded further in my paper. But um, the problem I've set myself is, how do we think about all that we've been talking about for the past couple of days? What are some frameworks for thinking? Because the problems are so many that our heads spin. We have to think about how we imagine the world, how we explain it, and where we go from here. So that's, that's the problem that I set myself. And I'm suggesting that we can imagine, or the world has been imagined, in four basic ways. We just talked about ecological questions of climate change and so on. One basic imaginary of the world, I call it one of the ontologies, is that human beings uh, can be imagined in geographic terms, that we are ge geographic ecolog ecologically organized, where people follow animals and plants and, and water tables and are guided by mountain ranges and so on. So people live on the planet according to physical uh, potential. Another major imaginary that, that came out in, in Professor Sherrill's uh, presentation is that we, we have lived at least since 1648 in Westphalian territorial units. So if you think of the world as a world of states uh, bounded by borders, some of which are blocked by uh, walls, as some people would like to have it. Um, so that's a second way of imagining the dynamics of world politics. A third way is to say that human societies are organized by, I should be changing this thing, shouldn't I? There we go. Um, see that that economic dynamics and structures organize human society by the logics of production and exchange. And D, other, another imaginary says that we are organized in terms of discourses of religion and modernizing ideologies, so that human beings coalesce in epistemic communities of identities and ideals, what some scholars call civilizations, for want of a better word. So these are four ways of, of describing the world. What about ways of explaining how things move? 
the, the dynamics of change are explained differently and also the problems of conflict are imagined differently in these four ontologies. And I would argue that there are four main ways of thinking about how things change or, or, or what makes things change. And, and also how we imagine what conflict is and therefore what, what we imagine peace is. There's of course the good old realism. Let's say ways of explaining the world. Realism basically says that change is driven by competitive survival, therefore maintain peace by deterring aggression and establish order that fits power hierarchies. So if the order doesn't fit the power hierarchy, people will defect from it and you'll have war. So you should obey the people who have the power and things will go fine. B is the liberal outlook, that change is driven by the free pursuit of individual projects, Conflict is caused by imperfect interdependence. Therefore, the way to peace is rationalize freedom in markets and let the increase in wealth satisfy wants and therefore reduce conflict. So that's the basic core of the liberal outlook. The third way of explaining social change is Marxism. Basically, it says change is driven by human cooperation and innovation to make a living from nature. Conflict is caused by inequitable rewards from shared work. Therefore, to make peace, democratize the relations of production by sharing control of the means of production. And then there's critical theory. Which argues, critical theory, including uh, postmodernism, um, constructivism, uh, uh, various aspects of post-colonial and feminist theory and so on, which basically says that change is driven by interfacing identities around differing worldviews, values, and aesthetics. Conflict arises from the hegemony of some worldviews and languages and thought forms and the resistance of others. Therefore, the way to peace is to expose hegemony and foster intersubjective dialogue. And then we have another outlook, largely driven by the major religions that say that change is driven by the human quest for meaning and fulfillment. And conflict arises from spiritual deficiencies of selfishness, lust, greed, pride, and revenge. Therefore, the way to seek peace in new ways of being, therefore seek peace in new ways of being by reflection and meditation or by practices of self-control, forgiveness, and charity in order to change society from the inside out. That is to say, instead of changing the material conditions that affect human beings, you change the human being so that the human being can change her environment. So the, the, the dynamics are recognized in the paradigms. So, so, so the, the, these paradigms, ways of explaining how, what human beings are, what our nature is, and how we move and operate, do not necessarily always coincide with the ontologies. So the way we picture the world doesn't always coincide with how we explain the world. So that some people who picture the world in, in state formations can also perhaps explain change in liberal terms and so on. So the patterns don't always coincide neatly. I suggest therefore, uh, um, here's so in a sense then what we're talking about is a gestalt way of imagining the world different people in the world are imagining living in the same world and imagining it differently and explaining it differently how do we get below that problem in my work what i've been doing is i call it um, dialect dialectical network analysis dna and the idea is to atomize the elements of analysis down into their common forms what's common to all of these that we're trying to talk about so how do we atomize the ontologies and the paradigms and reassemble them uh, in new ways? And I argue that we can do this through the notion of relationships within networks, which is why I was interested in, in our uh, colleagues' uh, presentation on networks earlier. But I think of it in a slightly different way. So the notion of networks with, within relationships. Relationships are performed and reproduced, and reproduced as people collaborate to meet needs for security, nurture, belonging, esteem or respect, authenticity, and creative fulfillment. Basically a Maslowian or Max Nephian idea of human needs. So that people come to, people form networks because they, they need something from each other. So it's not just I like your face, it's uh, 
do I need companionship? Do I need respect? Do we need to uh, plant crops together? We come together to meet our needs, and in the process, we create society. Parties to every relationship bring a mixture of four elements, motivations, ways of thinking and communicating, power, and creativity. The interface of encounters makes eight, eight archetypal patterns, and here I follow the late Manfred Halpern of Princeton, who, who drew on Jungian psychology to talk about the patterns we make when we encounter each other. And he, he spoke, speaks about what we would call hegemony, that's the mystification. You follow the party leader, you follow the director, whatever, and you, you, you respect authority. The mama relationship. Or there is coercion. That gets blown because you become too knowledgeable and too uppity. And so if in a situation of unequal power, you have to apply force. Another pattern of encounter is you're trying to talk to each other. It's kind of like mama and a two-year-old. No. It's, it's much of politics can be like mama and the two-year-old. And others. Uh, bargaining is another way. Give to get. Uh, maintain boundaries. You mind your, mind your business, I mind mine. So that gets played out over the politics of borders or the politics of roles in organizations and so on. Um, there's buffering where there's a tension between you and daddy, so you get mama to talk to daddy for you. And we see that played out buffering mechanisms in society. Um, you watch, you, you, you share a common sitcom that negotiates social tensions through comedy as a way to talk about difficult questions. Um, I'm forgetting some. But uh, another key one is what's called transformation. Live and let live. Not just live and let live, but mutual flourishing. I'm here for you, you are here for me. What the Greeks or the Christians would have called agape love. So, um, so, so the suggestion then is that we atomize human, uh, all these ontologies in terms of the patterns that they make, all of them are performed networks, almost like a halftime da dance at a football game. You make different patterns at different moments, depending on whether you're working, playing, whatever. Society makes different patterns. Um, power is used differently depending on the motivations and habits of thinking and speech. So power structures tell only half the story of change and conflict. What tends to happen in the modern paradigms of realism, liberalism, and Marxism is that they're all telling structural stories about power, except that realists are talking about the power of states. Liberals are talking about the power of corporations and markets, and markets are talk, uh, Marxists are talking about the power of classes, but everybody's talking about power in a different way. Um, so, in, in the next figures that I'm going to show you, they summarize the typical intersections of the many networks of ecology, national territory, production and trade, identities and discourses that constitute contemporary world society. So in a sense, I'm drawing on all these these traditions of literature to make a, a gestalt composite picture, my picture of world politics that I hope we can find useful. The, the picture suggests that there are structural archetypes in addition to relational archetypes. So when I encounter you in the corridor over the, uh, in the lunchroom, that's a one-off encounter. But if we keep repeating it several times, we begin to see patterns. And what I'm suggesting is that they are both relational archetypes as well as structural archetypes in the pictures that I'm about to show you, and that structural ar archetypes are repeated and mutating networks that keep reenacting the same basic shapes in new places and details of configuration. And so to the pictures. So one basic uh, uh, gestalt that we can look at, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the dotted lines are territorial, territorial states. The big blue spiral is a global mode of capitalism. You notice it keeps expanding as it spirals because it's, it's dynamic. It has to keep on growing in order to stay alive. The, the red triangles are the state that governs the territorial space. And the metaphor there is meant to suggest that the state is captured in the projects of global capitalism. The little, the little self-articulated um, circles, arrow, self-articulated arrows, are meant to represent indigenous forms of production on the peripheries of the settler societies that have been left out uh, uh, but, are being, but are being threatened by the expanding blue circle. But they represent, in, in every continent, north and south, are uh, pockets of remaining earlier settlement patterns and ways of living with nature 
that have, are, are threatened by modernity. So that's one image. Second image is <clears throat> based, uh, built up on, on uh, several traditions of scholarship, uh, the Latin American School of Dependency Theory, the Emmanuel Wallerstein, Andre Gunder Frank on, on structural violence, except that, not uh, Andre Gunder Frank, Johann Galtung on structural violence, Gunder Frank of the Latin American School. They're all basically telling the same story. Uh, a more recent scholar, um, Sandra Halperin, has argued that the, the, those big blue dots are cities, uh, or, or port cities, trading centers, if you like. So that archetype goes back to the Silk Road, to the Persian Gulf trade, to the East African and South India trade, um, to, the, to uh, patterns of trade within the Americas. Basically what we find, those, those red lines going into the big blue patches are, are hinterland relationships with, with the hubs at port cities. Essentially those are lines of pillage and extraction in, in ancient times. In modern times, they are lines of unequal exchange between rural workers, uh, peasant populations who send crops to the cities but who don't, don't get the value added from the crops. There might be mining workers who are sending diamonds or bauxite or whatever to urban centers to be sent uh, elsewhere. So in a sense, most of world trade is between the dots, between cosmopolitan centers, the New York's, Paris's, and London's of the world, and that um, they each are centers of extraction from some hinterland area. So that's the basic archetype that Sandra Halpering argues that the world economy basically reenacts over several centuries. The difference is that after the 15th century, it became one big circuit of trade and capital movement. But, but my addition is, is the idea of epistemic spaces. So the different color patches are meant to represent the thought clouds above people's heads. So in a sense, as, as ideas move from one space to another, they're also passing through different language areas, uh, epistemic communities, value systems, cultures, if you like. Um, so that's, that's my way of sort of uh, putting the, the ontologies on top of one another. So that we get to the third image, in a sense, that's a kind of a complicated picture of, of the two first images uh, wrapped up together. Uh, you get the picture there, I think. So what I use this model, I use this model as a critique of what's called development. I argue that no development is happening in the world. There's modernization, but no development. Um, that the only thing that's really reproduced as a self-reproducing system is that big circle of capital and the indigenous communities that are outside of it. Those are the only two things that are autonomous, self-reproducing self systems. And that what's basically happening is that one kind of development is eating up the other kinds and eating up the earth as well as, as, uh, as we just heard. But I also, for today's purposes, use it as a critique of conflict. And I use it to map, ask myself, where, when we look at the wars around the world, where are they taking place in relation to the model? And so the rest of my paper is basically about mapping the wars, the patterns of conflict, and, the, and how the, the patterns of encounter shaped by these archetypes uh, and, and habits of thinking generate conflict. So the system is conflictual. You can see that these are patterns of extraction, competition, rivalry, and so on. But they don't always, conflict does not always take the form of violence. Sometimes it takes the form of unequal bargains. Sometimes it takes the form of, of hegemonic representations where you're suffering, but you don't protest because you subscribe to the language or to the ideas of, of a hegemonic sentence that said this is the, the way the world should be, and so we accept it. So dominance is not always violent. Al although it is always structurally violent, it is not always overtly violent. And my question is, how do we map the overt violence that results from the, the mapping of, of patterns of encounter. And um, we could, in conversation, then flesh out the interplay between patterns of power, patterns of thinking, epistemic conflict, hegemonies of language and ideas, and resistance of, of, of language and ideas, and tell different stories about 
the thoughts and ideas through which conflicts get mediated and how they shape patterns of encounter. Um, since we're out of time, I'll simply uh, offer you an insight which we can talk about you know, afterwards. I would suggest that the main patterns of conflict today, in addition to the, the structural patterns, uh, if I could just go back to there. I wish I had a pointer. But in a sense, the conditions of, of the global circuits of capital and so on, it's also creating similar conditions all over the world, in both North and South, similar mixes of people through migration, similar conditions of the entry and exit of capital, similar mixes of products, similar uh, challenges to the maintenance of, of uh, peace uh, across these different front lines. So in, in a sense, what we are recognizing is that there is a, a kind of a convergence of the mix around the world. Um, and that <clears throat> we conflict not only in the contents of, of the things we argue about, but also in the styles of conflict that we, that we use to prosecute conflict and collaboration. Uh, let, let me just, it's easier for me to read it since it's less than a minute yet. I would suggest that uh, the conflicts of the 21st century are dri driven by three deep subconscious instincts or reflexes that shape the main epistemologies, ideologies, and theologies, and popular sensibilities that people bring to participation in encounters within and across natural environments, national societies, economic formations, and thought communities. And, and I would suggest these three. A, one instinct is security of the tribe, suspicion of rapid change, rigid thinking, and rejection of complexity. So you notice that the world is becoming more complex and more fluid in these many systems. And one reaction to it, it's too much. Let me just withdraw into my comfort framework and reject the complexity. That's one habit of thinking. And it's not confined to any one thought community or paradigm. So we have fund fundamentalist Christians, fundamentalist Marxists, fundamentalists of all kinds. It's, it's a habit of thinking. A, a second a reflex is curiosity about other tribes and their ideas and artifacts revisionary thinking and openness to change. It's what liberalism with a small L used to mean, or a liberal education in college. They're willing to postulate certain ideas, see how they work for a while, debate them, and then be willing to revise them yet again. So it's not quite rigid fixed thinking. I call it revisionary thinking. A little bit better than rigid, but not quite the next one. And the third one I would argue is uh, motivate, motivated by adjusted for all tribes, fluid or dialectical thinking, an embrace of complexity and change. And I would suggest that each of these habits of thinking is deeply personal as well as powerful for social bonding. They, they're powerful for holding networks together. Movement from one instinctive path to another seldom comes by empirical or theoretical debate. I say we can argue with people across these divides until the cows come home. We're talking from different ontologies completely, different ways of thinking about reality. Um, so movement from one instinctive path to another seldom comes by empirical and theoretical debate or by Socratic um, ethical dialogue. There is in some philosophical tradition, the idea, if we can only get everybody in a room and deliberate for long enough, we will come up with the same solutions. I doubt that. Movement from security to curiosity to transformational justice, I, in my view, demands deep spiritual revolution. And in my view, this is not a purely human project. Thank you very much. Okay, for our third and final speaker on the panel, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Haddon. Dr. Haddon is an associate professor in the Department of Government and Politics, and also here at Maryland, she's a faculty affiliate 
at the Center for International Development and Conflict Management and also the Center for Global Sustainability. Her research in international relations focuses on questions of global environmental politics, um, typically thinking about non-state actors and social movements and the way that those actors are connected using network analysis. Um, she's been the recipient of several prestigious um, sort of funding, um, sources of funding and fellowships, including from the Fulbright Fellowship Program, the National Science Foundation, and a few years ago, she spent a year on an international affairs fellowship from the Council on Foreign Relations, working at the State Department on issues related to climate change. Um, Dr. Haddon's book, Networks in Contention, The Divisive Politics of Climate Change, which was published by Cambridge University Press three years ago, has won several um, book awards, including prestigious awards from the American Political Science Association and also the International Studies Association. So Dr. Haddon is going to pose the question to us today, toward climate justice, emerging trends in the governance of global warming. All right, well thank you Todd for that kind introduction and thank you as well for the invitation to speak today. Um, many of you know, and I think Simon referenced in his presentation, that last week the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a alarming new report that detailed really how little time we have to act on climate change in order to avoid the worst impacts. And as we know that these impacts of climate change directly affect uh, peace, security, and equity, and global governance, and all the other themes of this conference, I wanted to speak a little bit more about that today. I will talk a little bit first about how climate change is an issue of equity. It's both um, a reflection of and a potential contributor to structural inequity. Um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about how non-state actors, civil society organizations, and social movements are organizing as both a complement and potentially as a substitute to substitute for uh, traditional global governance in this sphere. And so these are sort of new emerging trends in this area that I think are deserving of our attention because they're potentially very promising as new pathways towards mitigation and adaptation in light of potential state withdrawal from this area. So first, by the way of background, I wanted to say uh, that I have done quite a bit of academic work ex examining how civil society and, and social movements engage on the topic of climate change. This includes a book project that follows this topic really in the period from 2007 to 2014. Then I also worked at the State Department partially on civil society engagement around the time of the Paris Agreement. So I have a lot of academic and also non-academic background in this area. And one of my findings from my academic research was that during the time period of my study, really you know, starting 2005 and consolidating in 2007, there was an interesting new global movement that emerged that was pushing for what was called global climate justice. In a lot of ways, this movement contrasted with and sometimes conflicted with the more traditional environmental issue by treating the problem differently and by also calling for different kinds of solutions. So I first wanna talk about that a little bit more because I think it directly relates to the problem of structural equity and how we view the climate change problem going forward. So, Traditionally, when we think about climate change, we think about it as being a global commons issue. And here at the University of Maryland, students are typically taught that climate change is kind of our archetypical global commons problem. Um, a commons, like the atmosphere, is, is a resource domain that contains something useful to humans, and it's governed by being open to all, right? So there's, there's little uh, restriction on access to the commons. As a result of that, it's typically argued that it's prone to overuse. And as a result of that, governing the commons requires that all users, and including potential users of the commons, uh, be involved in regulatory or privatization schemes to limit its use. And as a result of this framing, which was very dominant, I think, in the environmental community, uh, traditional environmental organizations and NGOs have long emphasized that states have sort of a common responsibility related to climate change and have typically called for all countries, both developed and developing countries, to make reductions in greenhouse gas emissions as a way of preserving the future of the planet. And I think there was a movement that started around 2005, around 2007 in the global justice community that called into question that as being the dominant framing of climate change. 
And they did so by really pointing to the fundamental structural inequities that are baked into the climate issue. So this figure, I think, really illustrates that very well. Um, here on the y-axis, you see the cumulative CO2 emissions uh, per capita by country. And one of the things that we see is that countries like Great Britain, uh, the US, and Germany have very high cumulative emissions because they began emitting greenhouse gases really at the start of the Industrial Revolution and maybe even earlier than that due to deforestation. So these countries have quite a bit in terms of their cumulative CO2 emissions, but then there's the majority of the countries in the world that have contributed very little on a, on a per capita basis in terms of cumulative, per, uh, cumulative emissions. Sort of the other axis here relates to vulnerability to climate change, and this is a composite of different kinds of measures. Um, it includes exposure to flood risk, extreme heat, changes in precipitation, all sorts of things that can be disruptive to human society. And it also includes a measure of a society's capacity to adapt to those disruptions. So obviously places that are richer, that have a stronger social fabric are better able to adapt to these kinds of ecological impacts. And so what we see here is that all countries in the world are somewhat vulnerable to climate change. We're all facing this together, but at the same time there's quite a bit of variation amongst countries in the world. Um, particularly we see that developed countries in the Northern Hemisphere are generally less vulnerable than the least developed countries in Southeast Asia and Africa. But the main takeaway of this figure, as you've probably gathered, is that climate vulnerability and historical responsibility are, are negatively related. Um, and as a result of this, those that are least responsible are most vulnerable and vice versa. So moreover than that, uh, as climate change progresses, it has the potential to further exacerbate these inequities by making it even harder for least developed countries to obtain economic and social pro progress as they deal with the brunt of climate impacts. And as a result, and I think this is where civil society comes in, uh, an equally valid framing of the climate problem would be to think of it not as a global commons problem, but rather as a, as a rather significant transboundary externality that's really been imposed by developed countries on least developed countries through their historical emissions uh, that have not been matched in the developing world. And so climate justice movement campaigners really picked up on this alternative framing, uh, making the case that calling for sort of a common responsibility on climate change is really unjust because it doesn't take into account these differences in vulnerability and historical responsibility. And so by doing so, they in some ways uh, contrasted and maybe even conflicted with the traditional movement by calling for uh, action on the part of only some states uh, rather than calling for action on the part of all states. These next two slides uh, visualize the same data slightly differently. Here, uh, you can see that the land mass of a state is sized by the cumulative CO2 emissions. These are not the per capita emissions like they were in the previous slide, which is why China is quite a bit bigger here because obviously China has a large population. Um, you can see here again though that North America and Europe are quite large um, with South America and Africa being very, very tiny in this figure. Um, and if you contrast this with the other visualization based on uh, the, the number of people who are at risk of climate impacts, you can see again the same trend that those that are most responsible um, are least likely to be impacted by climate change. Here we see that Asia and Africa uh, have the, the largest number of people at risk. So clearly I think there's a structural inequity problem here. It's something that has uh, been picked up on in the uh, by environmental organizers. This is the next slide, sorry. Another important dimension is that this structural inequity doesn't just affect equity between states, it also concerns equities in relation to different groups within states. Um, so it, 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 the climate change also holds the potential to atten attenuate inequalities that exist within countries on the basis of race, class, gender, indigenous status, and all sorts of other things. Um, and here I just pulled one example, which is from a campaign by the NAACP uh, in Michigan called the Just Energy Campaign. And it's basically trying to make the case that energy policy is really a civil rights issue. And this uh, figure on the left up here demonstrates that because minorities are much more likely to live near coal-fired power plants 
they're disproportionately affected by the associated health impacts, which has the potential for furthering racial inequity. So even in the causes of climate change, we see that this can hold the potential to uh, continue these inequities within societies. So given the pretty serious problems of inequity, the economic and national security implications of climate inaction, we might expect that countries would be pretty active in trying to combat climate change on the global stage. But in reality, I think the history of global climate cooperation has been much more challenging and has demonstrated some of the limitations of our current system of global governance. So climate negotiations have been challenging for a long time, uh, really due to this tension between developed and developing countries and what role they should take in the mitigation of climate change. So in the very earliest rounds of negotiations, developing countries uh, did not accept emissions reductions targets um, because they claimed that they were not responsible for the problem historically and therefore didn't need to take on these targets. Um, and in 1997, really the first agreement that was made internationally, the Kyoto Protocol, was actually an agreement amongst developed countries in an effort to sort of take the lead on climate change. But there were two real limitations to that. One was that the United States ultimately did not ratify the Kyoto Protocol, so the world's largest emitter at that time did not join the Kyoto Protocol. And the second was that, moreover, many of the developed countries that did join the Kyoto Protocol ultimately failed to meet their targets. So there wasn't really a lot of evidence that developed countries were living up to this promise of taking the lead. This sets sort of the stage for understanding what happened in about the mid-2000s when developing countries surpassed developed countries as the major emitters in the world. So now developing countries are responsible for the majority of our current emissions on an annual basis, although still not uh, primarily responsible for the majority of historical emissions. Uh, and it became clear from an environmental integrity perspective that if we actually want to stop climate change, we have to address emissions in developing countries as well, because China is now the world's largest emitter, India is growing at a quick pace, so how do we solve this governance problem when we have this, match between, this mismatch between current emissions and historical responsibility? And the next step in this process was to try to negotiate an agreement in Copenhagen to, um, to come after the Kyoto Protocol those negotiations almost collapsed over exactly this issue of sort of what developing countries should do and whether developed countries would take on any positions if developing countries would not. Uh, it ended with a non-binding agreement where countries agreed to take on voluntary commitments. Uh, this was heartily criticized at the time, but maybe it's one of those things that looks a little bit better uh, in hindsight because surprisingly a lot of countries did take on these commitments, including major developing economies. They, were not widely expected to, but they did submit commitments under the Copenhagen Accord. And one of the other things that happened as a result of the Copenhagen Accord was an agreement to provide adaptation aid to developing countries. Whether or not that aid will fully materialize is, is another question, but it does seem like it's the first time that governments at least agreed that there should be a framework for doing so. In a lot of ways, the Paris Agreement in 2015 followed on that same format of having countries submit uh, non-binding voluntary commitments. The difference between the Copenhagen Accord and the Paris Agreement was that there was much more collective input into the development of these targets. There was much more discussion about this from an environmental perspective about what countries should really be doing on climate and that the U.S. and China made a joint announcement about their commitments together, which was seen as a sign of sort of cooperation on the global level. However, as you all know, the Trump administration has uh, somewhat recently announced the intent to withdraw the U.S. from the Paris Agreement. Um, this hasn't happened yet because it can happen for several years, but the main concern that they've cited is how developing countries are not covered uh, in the same way that the United States is covered in the climate agreement. So whether or not that's the case, it is certainly the perception of some people that there is still a lack of, of fair treatment of the United States in this agreement. So I would say you know, overall, in summary, the intergovernmental process has a somewhat weak record. Um, it has been underway for almost 30 years. It has been marked by discord in a lot of areas. Uh, 
and uh, global emissions of greenhouse gases have yet to fall. We have an important agreement in place that could be important in this area, but at the same time, we also have the major emitter, um, one of the major emitters, the second largest emitter in the world, that has announced an intent to withdraw from that and has also been undoing domestic policy in this area. So there's a lot of uncertainty about what the traditional system of global governance can provide. But I think one of the bright spots in this process uh, related to the Paris Agreement was that the negotiators for the first time made an explicit attempt to include the commitments of civil society actors. So states and regions, firms, cities, faith communities, universities, and other actors were all invited to submit concrete emissions reduction targets as part of the Paris process in addition to the targets submitted by states. And these, just like the state targets, are compiled, tracked, and they're reported by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is a really interesting innovation from a governance perspective because it recognizes, I think, the important role that these states play as actually, these, these non-state actors play as real governors in the process and as the real sources of emissions in the world. Um, so, these slides cover some of the initiatives that have been sponsored under that Paris Agreement agenda. Uh, as of today, there are almost uh, 13,000 stakeholders all over the globe involved, and they're engaging in almost 20,000 different actions to reduce emissions, all of which are tracked centrally by the United Nations. Um, this includes, for example, uh, the Baha'i Faith is involved in an initiative called Interfaith Power and Light, which promotes uh, moral education about climate change as well as efforts to reduce emissions from houses of worship. And there's a network of thousands of houses of worship all over the world that are participating in a similar initiative. Uh, another interesting initiative is one that's domestic but with global importance and, and global, yeah, global implications. Um, I think one of the most interesting aspects of this action is that it provides some resiliency to the Paris Agreement when state actors fail to meet their commitments. So for example, in the wake of the Trump administration's announcement of intent to withdraw, uh, coalitions of non-state and sub-state actors emerged that pledged to try to meet the U.S.'s emissions reductions target without the federal government. And this is called uh, the America's Pledge proposal. Uh, it's organized largely by Michael Bloomberg. This coalition comprises about 3,500 states, businesses, and universities, including the University of Maryland, who have pledged to do their part, representing 50% of the U.S. population and 60% of U.S. GDP, which makes this coalition uh, equivalent to the uh, world's third largest economy. Um, I think President Obama said it well when he said, you know, when we talk about climate change, ultimately, the work is up to each of us, and that's why America's pledge on climate is so important. The coalition makes it clear that people are organized in ways below just the state system, that we're organized in lots of different communities, and those communities all have the potential to act here. And one of the interesting things is that recent analysis from here at the University of Maryland indicates that this coalition could actually be pretty impactful. The analysis from the School of Public Policy suggests that this coalition could potentially drive down U.S. emissions by roughly 24% from 2005 levels by 2025, which nearly gets us to the U.S. pledge under the Paris Agreement, which was to reduce emissions by 26 to 28%. So this coalition actually, independent of federal action, has some real agency here to act on mitigation. One final thing I wanted to highlight, and this relates to some of the other things that we talked about related to uh, oil pipelines and whatnot, is that global civil society actors have also been working really hard to oppose new fossil fuel projects. And to a significant extent, I think this is a response to gaps in policy and it's a response to, um, to the inconsistency between these projects and the stated climate goals of different governments. Um, building on the highly successful Beyond Coal campaign in the United States, uh, NGOs and climate justice organizations have engaged in outreach all over the world to train local people to oppose the construction of new coal-fired power plants in their communities. And these slides just show a few examples of this. Um, the one on the top is from Michigan, but the other ones are from Kenya, the Philippines, and Bangladesh. I have recently been conducting research on this global anti-coal movement, and I have found that of all of the uh, proposed, new, new and proposed coal-fired power plants in the world, 
I found that about half of them are protested, which is really surprising. It's really quite a high number. And so in a time period where I think many decision makers are a little bit on the fence, the fence about whether they want to invest in coal or other forms of energy, I think it's reasonable to think that this public opposition could be influential and it could be impactful on sort of directly impacting our emissions trajectories. So one of the things I hope to do is to track these projects to their outcomes in order to evaluate the effectiveness of this new strategy uh, that's, that's taking place. So just to conclude, I think it's clear that climate change is an issue marked by significant structural inequalities. This creates additional challenges for international uh, and intergovernmental solutions. But partially in reaction to that, uh, partially as a complement or perhaps a substitute, new movements are emerging to address climate justice. These have focused on grassroots solutions to global problems. And I think that one of the upsides here is that these networks uh, will also likely help to cope and adapt to climate change in the event that we don't fully mitigate and that we have to adapt to some of these impacts. Uh, the final conclusion I just make here is that I think that this pretty complicated and decentralized global governance that I've described here may prove an important complement to or substitute for governmental processes. The civil society action generates additional creativity and ambition for mitigation, which are things that we really need in this area, and may be most useful in places where states are unable or unwilling to act. Uh, and I think investigating sort of variation in this action by non-state actors is a really interesting challenge for scholars to tackle going forward. So thank you.